Dave, give me the double. Thumbs up. We're ready to taxi. Ready to go. My name is David Albrecht, and this is September 7th, 2007. What is your full name, sir? My name is Anthony Sapienza. And when and where were you born? I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, 11th of November, 1923. And which squadron were you attached to? 514th. Um, when did you uh, uh, join the military? Were you drafted or did you volunteer? I volunteered in June the 23rd, 1942. June 23rd, 1942. The day I'll never forget. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, when you joined, or when you volunteered rather, uh, did you have in mind to be working for the Army Air Corps, Army Air Force? Yes, I wanted to be in the Air Corps. It was the Air Corps at that point. It hadn't right. been the Army Air Force yet. Yeah, right. Um, what, why was that? What attracted you to the Army Air Force? Well, it was a more interesting occupation. I thought being a mechanic would be more, uh, more interesting than being a ground pounder, I guess they called it. I did try to get in the Navy, but they... Navy uh, turned me down on account of a, a defect I had. Okay. Okay. The um, uh, looking back before you volunteered um, and back into the pre-war years, uh, did the hardships of the Great Depression toughen you for your experience in the military? What was it like during the Great Depression for you? Well, wasn't too bad. We. Uh, my dad had a pretty good uh, position, job, and uh, we did have some of the problems that a lot of people had for, in the Depression, but it wasn't that bad. I can't really remember. I do remember that we didn't have three meals a day sometimes, but still it wasn't that bad. Okay, okay. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, or when you heard the speech by Franklin Roosevelt, do you remember where you were or what you were doing? I was in a bowling alley. It was on a Sunday when I heard about it. And uh, I never even knew the word, where Pearl Harbor was. Most Americans didn't, even, actually. Even though I was a high school person, I should have known. <clears throat> so you were, pl you were bowling and they put it over the loudspeaker? Yeah, she said uh, they just bomb Pearl Harbor, and I said, where is Pearl Harbor, you know? Maybe they said Hawaii, one would know, but they just mentioned the word Pearl Harbor this morning, I couldn't know. Um, did, the, did the reaction or desire for revenge or uh, uh, that sort of thing motivate you to volunteer, or were you just trying to volunteer so you weren't drafted? Well, you could say, uh, so I didn't get drafted into the Army, I was still in school at the time. High school. High school, yeah. I was a senior, and I graduated on a Friday, and I went into the Air Corps on a Monday. Ah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you were like thousands, thousands of others, thousands, thousands of other young men. Fools. <laughs> so what was your uh, training experience like? Where did you go to boot camp, and then where did you receive your, uh, your advanced training? Well, uh, I went to... Uh, Shepherd Field, Texas, for, uh, it was kind of a basic, and you all at the same time you took your uh, mechanical training there. And uh, that's what you could say is our training. From there I went to uh, Glen Ole Martin Factory in Baltimore, Maryland, Middle River, Maryland it's called, on uh, B-26s. The aircraft they called a flying prostitute. I don't know if you heard about that. And then I was reassigned. Then I went overseas and I wound up on B 24s and the 514. Going back, why did they? I hadn't heard the B 26, the Marauder, I think was the, yes, the type, yeah. but they called it the flying prostitute. Why was that? I, I had no heard. means of support. No means of support. It was kind of a short wing, two, en two engine aircraft. So and it was one of those that it was iffy if it was going to fly or not. 
So it didn't have a lot of lift, is that it what you're saying? It didn't have much lift, but it still was a good airplane. All right, well, I, I learned something today. Thank you, thank yeah. you. So then you went to the B-24s. You After, you know, after I went to, uh, after the uh, B-26 training at Glen O. Martin factory, I went to, uh, where is it, in Utah. When you get my age, you forget. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> it's in Utah. And then that's where we took uh, overseas training, even the ground crews. It kind of showed us how to use the rifle and all that stuff. I never had to do that until I was getting ready to go overseas. And then I went to San Francisco and shipped out from there. And then were you uh, enlisted or an officer? I was enlisted. I was a crew chief. Crew chief. Yeah. So that would be a, a senior non-commissioned officer? Non-commissioned, yeah. Very good. Very good. And um, I was curious what you uh, thought the the strengths and the weaknesses of the B-24 were from a, you know, a maintenance or a mechanical standpoint? Well, looking back, I thought it was a good airplane. Maybe I'm being biased, but to me, it was reliable. To, uh, looking at it now, it looked like a crude piece of an airplane compared to what we have now in the service. And it, was, it was okay, I think. Did you have any chance to, any experience, did you hear scuttlebutt about the B-17, whether the B-24 was easier to care for than the B-17 at all? I never heard that when I was overseas. Uh, I know there's always a rival talk about the B-17s and B-24s. Well, of course. We of don't course. talk B-17, that's dirty work. That's right, that's right. <laughs> In our that's, groups, yeah. That's right. That's. But the, the only thing older. worse is to talk about the mighty Eighth Air Force, yeah. right? The Hollywood Air Force. They that's, had good publicity. Yeah, that's right. Good marketing. <laughs> As my father says, they didn't take off, but there wasn't at least five cameras rolling. Yeah, right. You're right. And right. coming back with their tail half shot off, they they were good airplane. They all did the job. Right? Sure, sure. And even though the mighty Eighth did get all the publicity, you know, flying over Germany. Well, the way they did over Northern Europe in 42, 43, they certainly paid for it. That's true, yeah. Um, I want to talk a little more about your uh, experience as a crew chief. What was the uh, makeup of a typical grounds crew? Well, we had, uh, there was four, four mechanics, and I think we had a, uh, I'm not sure if we had two ornament or one for each airplane. The armament took care of the guns and loaded the weapon, the bombs on the aircraft. And the mechanics, uh, we took care of the aircraft, changed engines, props, whatever the necessary thing to get it pliable for the next mission. What would have happened in terms of if there's some really bad structural damage, for example, they couldn't get the uh, the bomb bay doors were frozen shut, so they dropped the bombs through the bomb bay doors. That's correct. Yeah, they did that, and all we did is uh, that didn't make us too happy. <laughs> we had to replace the bomb bay door. That happened quite a, quite a lot. So they freeze shut sometimes, kind of mud get in there or just high altitude freeze, and so they just dropped them through. Sure, sure. And the doors were they were kind of a flimsy aluminum skin which rolled up on tracks along the side. Actually, they weren't that hard to replace and they weren't very heavy. Two people could lift it up, hang it back on the track. What, I had, what I've read is that basically 100 pounds of weight would break through the oh, bomb Oh, easily, so, easily, yeah. So if you were, you know, if you yeah. stepped on one, you're going to go through. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. It, uh, up in the air or even on the ground. No excuse on the ground to break them. So you had four mechanics and you had an armament. Well, I was counting the crew chief and crew the chief. three, three, four people, four mechanics per aircraft. Yeah. All right, all right. And uh, <clears throat> what was your, what was your typical work day? Like? You must have been working all the time. Well, not all the time. Sometimes, sometimes it wasn't too bad. Uh, if everything was okay, maybe one or two people would go out to the airplane. It depends on uh, the condition from the last mission, how, how bad it was. 
But sometimes they just come back and they're okay. There's no problems with them. Maybe a few minor oil leaks on the engines, and so either washed it off or tightened up the rocker box covers or something like that. Well, let's say you had an engine that got shot up or malfunctioned. How long would it take you to, to switch out an engine? Oh, to change an engine, that's a good job. You had to pull the props, pull the engine. I'm trying to think how many hours that took. Usually uh, the airplane was out of service for maybe a day. What you had to do is get the new engine uncrated, transfer all the uh, uh, the uh, uh, accessories from one engine to the other, like the carburetor, the fuel pump, the hydraulic pump, if it's a number three engine, and stuff like that. You had to transfer it over to the to the new engine, and you had to hang it and then hang the prop back on. Then you had a test flight, sometimes they test flight them for engine, they call it running the engine in slow, just like breaking in a new engine like in your automobile maybe, which people don't do that now. But. Sure, sure. Um, the number three engine you said was the was where the hydraulics were? Or uh, it's ramp? one of the pumps, yeah, when you start I think it was three, three, four, one, two, I think it was the starting uh, my mind doesn't remember, but three you had the hydraulic. And you always want to get your hydraulics up because you had the landing gear was concerned with the hydraulics, yeah, you know, get the, the flaps and stuff. So get it warmed up, get it, get the, the, you wanna, the juices flowing. Yeah, you want to make sure you have pressure so pressure. That's the right. gear don't go up on you, or, which or could do on the ground. That would be bad. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be embarrassing. Wouldn't it? Sure, sure. Yeah. Then when, when the plane was in the air, though, I guess if the number three engine was, was a hydraulic pump, if they lost number three, then would that... Would that or they, I think they had an auxiliary pump, too. All right. I can't remember. That's a good question. Well, you know, it's, it's just a... Look, just, I'll look that up over here. Yeah, yeah. On this. That's okay. The, uh, um, what were the uh, worst problems that you faced in terms of maintaining or repairing airplanes? Was it battle damage? Was it scarcity of spare parts? Was it weather? Weather, well, weather, us being out in it, that didn't matter. Didn't but were, were, were you in North Africa or did you get in it? In I was in uh, North Africa and then we moved to St. Pancrazio. But with, with the sand and everything, was it corrosive? The weather and the sand, was so, that? Uh, yeah, the, that was a bad thing with the sand and dust. The, the engines would only last about 100 hours because the sand would get into the, uh, what am I trying to think, the pistons, the uh, cylinder heads, and it ruined them, caused a lot of leak. And then they came out with a new filter, an air filter on the back of the engine where the intake, air intake was, and that slowed down the uh, deterioration of the engines on the sand. And say 100 hours per engine, yeah. that could be, especially flying out of North Africa, that could only be about 10 or 12 missions, and you're kind of, and that's if it Not wasn't damaged. Not even that, even. Yeah, I mean, that was if they weren't damaged or shot yeah. up. Yeah, our missions weren't too long out of there because just down, to, down in southern Italy and Greece, and Sicily, well, those places? Yeah, where, wherever the. Then as we moved up, the targets got farther because it was closer to the. Yeah, I was there when the uh, Blasty low level thing was. Wow. Yeah, that must have been depressing to be waiting on the, on the flight line, waiting for the crews to come back, and no one came back, or very well, few came back. Mine came back. Well, mine didn't even have a damage on it. Wow. Yeah. It just landed. It was okay. That's just covered it up. Probably one of the rare ones. Probably one of the rare ones. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> how well did you interact with the flyers that flew your aircraft? Well, they, you talk to them when they come out to the plane. And uh, usually the crew that flew mine was, was uh, Lieutenant Woods. I can remember his name. And uh, they all talk to you, you know, but they, 
after, you know, they did their job and 50 missions were required and then you, they were gone, you get somebody else or, and I lost one airplane, uh, then I got another one. So you just lose the crews. Well, that's the other thing I think that, you know, uh, people think of the, the Army Air Corps, the Army Air Force, they think of the flyers who do their, you know, 50 missions, or if they're extra long, it might be 35 flights, but, yeah, you know, right. they, they do that, and, you know, some of the pilots, some of the navigators or someone might be done in four months and be rotated back home, whereas, you know, grounds crew ground people, crew. you were there for the duration. Well, that's funny, yeah. I came home in uh, September the 1st, 1944. I don't know why, the group was still there. And there's another gentleman here at the convention that came home at the same time as did, George Cook. You might have interviewed him here. And we just came back and we just put on B 29s. It was starting the B 29 program. Oh. And so we wound up, I wound up as an instructor on B 29s. As a, I went to school, to flight engineer school, and then taught new people on the B 29. You know, that's one of the things I've noticed. A lot of the uh, flight engineers started out as in mechanic school, or what amounts to mechanic school, and then made either a split, either to stay on the grounds crew or go to flight engineer. Yeah, yeah. Did um, can you speak a little bit to the to the B twenty nine? Obviously, it's a more advanced, newer aircraft. How did it compare? Or any sort of observations compared well, to the twenty nine to the twenty four? It had a few advantages. It was pressurized for one thing. And and uh, it had an engineer's panel where the 24 did have an engineer's panel. And uh, I don't know, that's, it had uh, remote guns where you had a guy at a blister window looking and fired the guns remotely. And as far as the missions, I guess the 29 could get up higher with pressurization. I don't know. I think it had about a 4,000 mile range, and the B 24 had about 2,000. Two, 2, yeah, 2,500. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. The um, Going back to, to repair and damage, what was, uh, what was the most common or the, the worst type of? I mean, I'm obviously flak, but was, was the flak, uh, was it harder to fix uh, flak damage, say, in the fuel tank or the fuel pump or the, you know, the tail? Quarter. What was the what was the the worst area to, or the hardest area to fix in terms of battle damage? Well, most of the uh, small stuff we did ourselves. We just sometimes we used dope and fabric, you know, piece of cloth, and we use a dope, just to dope over the little hole, little small holes that were no major. Anything like you've seen in the pictures where the big, the tail is half missing. They would send the aircraft to what they call the repair depot. Let's see. I think ours was the 58th. Is that the service squadron? Service squadron. They do the heavy stuff. Maybe they do the heavy on the, on the gear or something where it's a major, major problem. But we did most of the little, the little stuff we did. Patch and we had cheap metal people also that took care of that. You just put a little skin patch on something. And then, of course, like the bomb doors, when they fell off or got ripped off, we just replaced those ourselves. And then things like in the fuel tank, if any hits in the fuel tank, it's usually it doesn't come back because that just causes an explosion and fire. I did have one, uh, one uh, small, I guess you'd say shrapnel, where the plaque hit one of my tanks, went in there, and I had to replace the repair of that. Had to repair. We did that. And uh, sometimes the leading edge, we just fixed those. And engines, if there was something wrong with those, we just changed them or replaced the uh, uh, cylinders, whatever they were. In terms of uh, getting spare parts or new engines or that sort of thing, did you did you experience problems getting those spare parts on time, or did you cannibalize a lot? How did that work? Was uh, was, was the Army Air Force's Army Air Corps logistics system 
good enough to get you most of what you needed when you needed it. I was trying to think. I can't remember. I know. Yeah, I think we, I don't think, yeah, we might have camelized, but it had to be a very bad. The other airplane would have to really be bad. It was real bad. They sent it to that service squadron. Now, one thing we had a problem with is uh, just tools for ourselves. We had a hard time getting tools. And uh, one time in Italy, a B-17 landed, brand new one from the States, for fuel. And while the crew had gone to the, the mess hall to eat, we went out and relieved them of their spare part toolboxes for our own use. I mean, everything, yeah, it's always like that. Yeah, I think parts, parts were pretty good. Engines, they had a lot of those. Had a big depot for engines. I can't remember if there's anything else. I know later on, and and even with the 29s, they had a hard time getting parts sometimes when we was training on it. Sure, sure. Um, moving on to a bit of a different topic. Uh, you know, obviously you're working a lot of the time because if there's not one thing wrong, there's something else wrong and the planes are coming and going. Uh, what did you and your uh, uh, grounds crew, uh, fellow grounds crewmen do for entertainment in your, you know, when you had some free time, if you had any, what did you do for entertainment or for fun? Oh, we, uh, well, sometimes you work all night. You could, when you got rid of the plane on a mission, you went back to went to sleep. And if it's kind of an easy time, we played baseball. I played baseball and the weather permitting in the Italy there. And then uh, we, we had a, a club, an enlist man's club there, and we'd go play. Of course, blackjack or dice was always, uh, card games were always a lot of entertainment. Sure, sure. And they had movies once in a while. But Sure. What can you, uh, you know, do you remember the men you worked with? Do you remember nicknames or any of that, anything like that? Yeah, I only remember one guy. His name was... Piercy, but that wasn't his name. That was his nickname, and I remember he was from Kentucky, and he used to tell me he played basketball on a gravel court, gravel. And then there was another guy named Hendrickson. He was from Minneapolis. In fact, uh, his wife is a, is a very good friend of ours. We still communicate over Christmas time. Christmas cards and stuff like that. And the other, yeah, I can't remember his name. That's funny. That's okay. When you get 80 plus, you know. That's okay. That's okay. You're doing very, very well. Um, in terms of your, uh, in terms of, of time to write letters home, did you receive many letters from the home front or did you write many letters? Home? Yeah, I wrote quite a lot. It's I, I can't remember just how long it took to communicate. Probably several weeks. Several anyway. weeks, I guess. And it was all free, as you remember. So uh, nowadays, you just get on your laptop and yeah, well, <laughs> times trans have changed. <laughs> yeah, boy, if we had that then, boy, we'd be happy with it. Sure, sure. Um, the uh, in terms of letters home. Did you receive many letters from home? Oh yeah, I got. Not like a lot of guys, they always had one from every girl. Yeah, I got mostly a lot. enough letters. Yeah. And what sort of things did you, did they tell you from home? Like, uh, what's what was the content of the letters? Or do you have any, is it, was it sort I of like just the, told what the war front, what the home front was, uh, how they were doing and everything like that. And they always say, miss you and, you know, typical. War letter, sure, sure. And then, what did you what did you tell them about? Well, whatever I could say, you know, was wasn't censored. Just said, well, it's another day, and you know, just 
you know, typical writing back. Because you always say, I love you <laughs> sure. to your parents. Sure, sure. Well, you know, one of the things I've, I've found, I've read some of those letters and I've, you know, talked with veterans about it. It was sometimes the sort of mundane, average things, the weather, the Yo. flowers blooming from home that really helped get you through because well, that true. remind you that there was something else going on. Oh, yeah. something something to go home to. And, uh, you know, I don't know too many of the veterans that would write what's really happening at the battlefront, they just want to write, yeah, we're okay. And, yeah. You know, we, we saw this nice French chateau today or whatever it was. Well, a and lot of that was censored, you know, you couldn't disclose. Sure, sure, sure. That's right, too. Well, you couldn't just disclose. Um, so then you were shipped uh, back to the States, what did you say, September 44? Yes, September the 1st, 1944. And you went to work. As a you went to went flight to, engineer school and then became an instructor of flight engineers for right. the B twenty nine. I went to Lyons, Nebraska to school and then I wound up in Almogorda, New Mexico. Wow. So uh did you uh did you uh, have any inkling that uh you know World War Two would be over in August oh, nineteen forty five? Was just surprise like everybody else? Well, yeah, I was surprised. I was in Almogordo when they when they tested the bomb. It was on a Monday morning, I believe. We was going out. A lot of them were going out on training, and they just the tower told everybody to just return to their their parking spot, and the missions, all the training was canceled for that day. And uh, later, we never. They just said an ammunition dump blew up. Well, a lot of people had seen those blow up, and they said it wasn't that bright because <laughs> it lit up the whole uh, sky there. That even morning. though it was, even though the sun was shining, it was brighter than the no, sun. It was kind of, well, it was kind of just breaking. It was just kind of getting daylight when it uh, when they tested it. I think it was around six a.m. I'm not sure when the uh, test bomb went off, and then a few days later. After they dropped the bomb in uh, Hiroshima, then we realized what it was. And the word atomic, a lot of people never, never even heard the word atomic. So it was, I think it was July 15th, so it was, but you said it was a Monday morning when they... I think it was. I'm not sure now. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, jumping back just a couple of months from that July back to May, was the end of war in Europe, was that a surprise to you? Or uh, w what were you doing on, I guess, what was it, May 7th, 1945? May 7th, yeah, 1945. I was at Almagorda, we were still training. Sure. Well, we still had the Pacific War to worry about. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then, as long as I'm on this topic of working my way back in time, um, what was your reaction when uh, Franklin Roosevelt passed away? This would have been April 12th. That's right. 1945, yeah. was that? Well, it was a shock. It was, he'd he'd uh, been the only president you had known, really. I mean, That's I'm, right, the I'm, only one I voted for. In fact, I was, the only time I could vote for him was, uh, what was it, 44? Yeah. 44. That's the only time I voted, because I wasn't old enough to. Well, you would, were, uh, when did you, you said you were born in 1924? 23. 23. Well, he, he was president in 1933, so you were just 10 years old. He had, Ten years, he had right. been the only only leader you had known. That's right, yeah. Although what's what's amazing to me is that, you know, you see him, you know, when he was elected, going the only thing to fear is fear itself yeah, speech. That's right. And when you get up to 1939 or even 1941, he's still, you know, no one knew he was on a wheelchair. Per, no one realized oh, that he was uh, physical, but he looked, he, he looked strong. I mean, but then when you look and say February from the Yalta conference, the newsreels in early 19... He does look tired. He did. He, he yeah, looked I'd really, really tired. I see those in the. I mean, the incredibly different sort of perspective. Yeah. Incredibly different perspective. It was kind of a shock. I can't remember just where I was or what I was doing. But then, uh, then uh, so you 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 finished up on the uh, uh, VJ Day, August. 1944, the bombs were dropped and the Japanese surrendered. When did you end up separating from the uh, Army Air Force? 
That's a good question. It was in September 1945. So you got out pretty quick. Well, you would you had gotten all your points anyway. Long. I mean, you had yes, I had those. Yeah, plenty of points. Yeah, I was at Almogordo then, and it, this is a funny story. I don't know if I should say that. Oh yeah. But at Almogordo, they they had a um, all the people. I wasn't involved. Maybe I was. They all went on a sit-down strike at headquarters. They all wanted out. A lot of them had the points, as they called in, and the war was over, and the people wanted to go home. So one day they all went to headquarters. There was maybe a thousand, two thousand men sitting around. The next day they had trains in there, and they shipped us all to uh, uh, Davis Moss in Tucson, Arizona, for separation. And the, the, they just went on strike the next. That's probably was unheard of of people, you know, protesting about trying to get out of the service. So I got discharged there at DM, Davis Moss. And uh, after you were discharged, did you, uh, did you, uh, um, did you uh, take advantage of anything like the GI Bill or? Oh yeah, I took, uh, I went to LA City College. And then I, I got in the reserves, air reserves at uh, Long Beach, California. And uh, I got recalled into the Korean conflict in 1950. Yeah. And, and what did you, uh, were you still grounds crew then? I was still ground then and uh, flight engineer on the 29th. But when I came back in, they seen I had 29 experience, so they put me in a 29 group and then I wound up in Korea in 52, and I wound up in a fighter fighter group. Wow. I didn't even, never even seen a fighter, you know. Uh, it was an F-86 group, one of the... One of the new... New type. Newfangled jet, jet engines, right? Oh, yeah. Right. And so, I was with the fourth fighter, the MiG killers, they call it. So yeah. what was the... Uh, what, were the, what was that like to work with uh, going from prop-driven aircraft to uh, uh, jet propulsion. What oh, I like that. Yeah, that's easy. A lot less maintenance on a jet engine. A lot easier engines to work on. In Korea, I didn't even work on them. I was in headquarters. I was in the IG section, inspector general. Thing. I'm the guy who wrote up all the bad, like the fire extinguishers are out of date for fence service. Ah, all right. There's a word for it, but I'm on Some mic. Yeah, I don't want to say. Oh, all right. <laughs> Chicken all right. plus. All right, all right, all right. I understand. Mm -hmm. I I hear you talking. I hear you. The uh, so did you stay on in the reserves after Korea? I stayed. Yeah. Well, I went. To, I just stayed and made a career out of the Air Force. All right. There's a yeah. reserve or active duty. Active duty. I went to active duty. Oh, very good. Yeah. And how long did you stay? Twenty-two years, counting my uh, wartime in uh, World War II in Korea. And did you did you remain in, in, in ground crew maintenance, or did you stay in the inspectors? What? No, what? I went when I uh, stayed on fighters. When I came back from Korea, I stayed, still stayed on fighters at uh, George Air Force Base, which is Victorville, California. It was a 94th Fighter Interceptor Squadron there. If you probably, I don't know if you know, but that's the famous Rickenbacker Hat and Ring Squadron he had in World War One. That was his squadron logo. And then from there, when I left George, I went to uh, March Field, which is at uh, Riverside, California. And there I was on in base flight. And I had a T-Bird and a, took a, took a big care of base flight stuff. Very good. Yeah. Wow. And then I'll tell you another good story. Sure. And then in March, I was with the U-2 program for two years. And I flew out. To, I, so I took care of the support aircraft at uh, Groom Lake, which is Site 51 in Nevada. With the beef, uh, with the U2s, and what about what year was that? That was fifty six, fifty seven. Oh wow, that's not too yeah. little. Just a couple of years before, you know, the the U2 yeah. incident. 
Yeah, I knew Gary Powers. I mean, he was one of the pilots out there. That's where they trained them all, is at Groom Lake. And uh, he was one of the pilots that trained there. And uh, it was all classified, as you know. It was under the CIA program. I didn't know I was under the CIA. All the pilots, everybody was, it was all civilian in a sense because it was under the CIA, but we still had our military ranks and everything. Wow. Interesting work. I'm sure. Yeah, it was, sure. It was a lot of fun. Well, we're uh, kind of kind of come to the end here. Oh, and, and okay. I wanted to, Boy, that's bad. Well, it, it moves fast. Once you yeah, get started, it moves fast. Get a lot of bull going on. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. This is, this yeah. is all part of trying to understand your, your contribution Okay. And um, you know your 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 contribution to the war effort, and also I I think it's very very important to get the grounds crewman's perspective, because you know, and this segues into one of, one of my last two questions, because you know the the pilots and the flight crews they're the ones that get lots of glory and lots of attention. Well, but, they took a lot of hazard too. You know, they, but. Uh, I feel the ground crews, if they weren't there, they wouldn't have got over the target. For you're, you're, you're quite, you're quite right. Maybe that's bragging, but... Uh, well, you know... It, you took, it took a village, you know. Yeah, it took a village. Very good. Yeah. I, uh, I, we interviewed a, one of the pilots from the 376 earlier today, and he said that, he said that the grounds crew were outstanding, and, that, and he used the term heroes to describe oh, yeah. you all. <laughs> that's unusual. Well, well, you know... Yeah. It just, do you? How do you feel about either yourself being considered a hero, or the pilots, or the your whole generation being hailed uh, as heroes? I don't think so. some of them are heroes. I mean, in the sense, what their duties were, but it was a job we had to do, and uh, so we did it. That's all. Yeah, it was a actually to me the uh, the military. Kind of give me a good course to go. I enjoyed my career in the military. I think it's a good, good career. Wow. I feel sorry for the ones now. I mean, it's not fair the way this conflict we have now is treating our military because it's. It's going to be a, a tough next generation. Next oh generation. yeah, it's a, it's very very tough. Yeah. The uh, the. Uh, <laughs> the last question I want to do is, uh, or I want to ask you, is uh, just to open the floor for you if you want to say anything, if there's something that I mentioned that triggered a memory, or if there's something else you want to say, uh, you know, some other perspective you want to add, you know. I, uh, I know at the meetings here at the conventions, I always kid the pilots. Uh, I say, well, you know, we give you a good airplane to fly and you bring it back all broke with holes in it. I said, that's no way to treat government property. You know? Just joking with the pilots. But they, you know, they did the job. Well, yeah, I could tell you a lot of crazy stories about well, ground crews, but you don't have the time. No, I've got the time. We got, we got a yeah. few minutes. So tell, tell me a crazy, what's the craziest or funniest story? Well, let me tell you one in San Pancrazio, my airplane came back from a mission and the number three booster pump was out. So, of course, you have to, no fuel booster pump. They don't work, you can't get the engines going. So, Henry and I, Hendrickson and I, it was late at night, so we decided to change the pump. Well, we had to. So we had, then we had, uh, I guess we call them black guards, you know, Afri call them African American now, but we call them Negroes and that. Anyhow, there was a guard out on the airplane. So Henry and I, Hendrickson, I call him Henry for short. Well, we got the pump from uh, supply. So we put it in and I says, well, Henry, I says, before we uh, fill the tanks for, uh, I said, let's see if this pump worked, because several times we've been getting pumps, and they were faulty from supply. So 
I said, okay. So he gets up in the cockpit, turns on the battery switch. Now this airplane is loaded for next next mission. It has 12 500 pound bombs in it. That's what they would carry for 500 pounds. Fully loaded and there's all the fuel except number three tank was full. So uh, Henry gets up there and he turns on the battery switch, turns on the booster pump and it doesn't work. And I says, Henry, it don't work. I says, oh wait, I forgot to ground it. So I took the ground wire and touched the pump and it sparked and the whole Bombay caught on fire. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, from fumes. So I says, Henry, the airplane is on fire. And I'm telling you, he shut the battery switch off and we dropped out. And I don't know if you're familiar how you get out of B-24, you have to drop out to Bombay. So Henry and I take off to the next revetment and we get over to aircraft 63 and we stopped. And it says, what the heck, it's gonna blow, it's gonna get us anyhow. So we just sat down by the wheel of 63 but all it burned was the fumes from the uh, tank. And if that thing had gone off, it had destroyed that whole air base almost. Nobody knows about it, just us two. Oh, and weird. the guard, we haven't seen him since. <laughs> we don't know where he went. He just disappeared. I don't blame him. So that was kind of an incident. That if that had gone off, We'd have taken that whole squadron out because all those bombs have been there, airplanes on both sides of it. So I guess God was with us. <laughs> I guess he must have been. Yeah, we started running. I thought, well, we can't outrun this. <laughs> yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, so we just sat down by the other airplane and started laughing. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. We, yeah, before he died, we used to talk about that story all the time. Well, that's a great story. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I keep thinking about putting it, sent it to the, uh, our uh, group paper there. The, the, the intelligencer? Yeah. yeah. That's a good story. You ought to share it. Yeah. You really ought to share it. So. There was another weird one. I don't know what you want to listen to. Please. We don't have the time. Do we? No, no, we got the time. We yeah. Got the time. Well, it's kind of funny. It wasn't funny, but one of the Army guys on the ball turret, as you know, he took the guns out of the ball turret, cleaned them. We had uh, some crews, uh, some groups had their gunners clean their own guns, but we had our armament people on each airplane. He took the ball guns out, cleaned them, put it back in, and he pulled the right one, the cables like, and a round went off, and the guns were pointing towards the mess tent, which I would say was maybe 300 yards away or something. And one round went right over the mess tent. I don't, we still don't know how one round fired. Just because usually you have to pull the trigger and everything, but he just went off. And he had cleaned the guns, put them up. Somehow one round was in there, 50 caliber. Did you catch any hell for that? Nobody even knew about it. I, guess. Wow. I don't think they did. Wow. Okay, I, I think our ornament man is here, the one who's on our airplane. He's a gentleman you probably interviewed him in a wheelchair. Yes. He just lives down the road here. And, uh, I think he's been interviewed. Yeah. His son's with him, I believe. Yeah, I believe he is. Or yeah. his daughters, too. Yeah, I yeah. think we have interviewed him. Yeah, he, uh, he might remember that. I'll have to ask him if he remembers that story. Right. Well, thank you very much for oh, your time, Oh, thank you sir. for your time. And this was outstanding. <laughs> it's so good to get the grounds crewman perspective. Well, I didn't give you much. Oh, yeah, you did. You gave me, gave me a lot. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay.